This program is made possible by Explorer Pipeline, by the OERB, representing Oklahoma's producers and royalty owners, and by ConocoPhillips. In the old movies, it was always exciting to strike oil. It was like finding money. It really was that way in Oklahoma. A century ago, there was a major discovery of black gold in the state. It was called the Glen Pool, a large oil field that created jobs and fortunes. People came to Oklahoma from across the country to be a part of it. The Glen Pool turned Tulsa into the oil capital of the world and helped make Oklahoma the energy state it is today. Glen Pool was as important to Oklahoma as a kickoff is to a football game. Glen Pool was the biggest producer in the country for a while. It attracted big people. This was pure, unadulterated excitement for people to come in here and to try their luck finding an oil well. It started the massive oil boom era in Oklahoma. It really was like finding gold, this liquid mineral. It ultimately was probably one of the biggest things that happened in not only Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the nation. Before Oklahoma was a state, it was Indian land. Dozens of tribes living off the earth. They farmed the prairies and hunted the plains. But their world was changing. In the late 1800s, white settlers were arriving in Indian territory, claiming whatever land was not occupied by the tribes. Communities rose on the prairies with Indian names of Muskogee and Sepulpa and Tulsa. The settlers farmed, raised cattle, and started businesses. But they were also interested in the petroleum beneath the ground. Wooden drilling derricks started appearing in this rugged frontier. They used a type of rig that was used for drilling for water. And these rigs would have a heavy weight on a rope and they lift the rope up and down and the weight would literally pound the hole down on the ground pulverizing the rock. And with those rigs you'd probably drill about 25 feet, maybe 60 feet a day. If you were in the right place you hit oil and if you were in the wrong place you didn't. And a lot of times they didn't know what was the right and what was the wrong. In 1901 an oil well sputtered to life in Red Fork, three miles southwest of Tulsa on the property of Dr. J.C.W. Bland and his wife, Sue. Newspapers as far away as Joplin in Kansas City reported this black gold, setting off a rush to the Tulsa area. Eastern oil companies have sent a thousand representatives down here to sniff out the area, see what's really going on with the oil industry here. There are attorneys, there are speculators, there are eastern bankers that are coming in. Everyone has got a reason for being here, and it has to do with the oil business. Red Fork produced less black gold than hoped, but it did bring many people to the Tulsa area, like Robert Galbraith. He was successful finding oil in Red Fork, but kept looking in other places too. In 1905, Galbraith found traces of petroleum 14 miles south of Tulsa on property belonging to a Creek Indian, Ida Glenn, and her husband, Robert. The Glens leased land to Galbraith, permitting him to put up a drilling rig, which was named the Ida Glenn No. 1. For months, Galbraith and his partners drilled deeper and deeper, but found nothing. Almost out of money, they were ready to give up drilling. On November 22, 1905, their luck changed. They put their head over the well hole and they start hearing this rumble. You know, they could hear this well building up. And all of a sudden, they, they all start running because they know what's going to happen. About 4 o'clock in the morning, it blows in wild. Gas and oil spews over the top of the derrick. He's got an oil well. Galbraith's got his oil well. Here was this man who was sleeping on the derrick floor. 
who didn't know where his next meal was coming from, who had spent his last dime uh, drilling this well, and the thing literally came in just as he ran out of money, and overnight, he's wealthy. Overnight. Thrilled with his discovery and his wealth, Robert Galbraith drilled more wells on the Glen Farm and kept finding decent amounts of black gold. Other oil men raced to the area, leased whatever property they could find so they too could drill. It was a risky business. A man could lose everything if he drilled and came up dry. But the land around the Glen Farm seemed so promising, many were willing to take the chance. A newly found productive oil field would have been the Las Vegas of its day. It's very speculative. It's a gamble, but the payoff can be incredible. They're going to lose the shirt off their back many times, but there will be those that will do very well. As more wells were drilled, more oil was found. It was almost like there was a lake of petroleum under the ground. So they began calling the area the Glen Pool. Tulsa really wanted it to be called the Tulsa oil field. Sepulpa really wanted it to be called the Sepulpa oil field. And, and uh, Bob Galbraith, the wildcatter, insisted that it be named for the Glens. Men furiously raced one another to get to the black gold, putting up drilling derricks as fast as they could around the Glen farm. Nearly every well they drilled hit oil. Time was money in the oil field. I mean, these rig builders were not even allowed to come down off the rigs to urinate. There was no break time. The faster you, people would work 16 to 18 hours a day, routinely. Go home, sleep for three or four hours, get up and work 16 or 18 hours again. Time was money, and if you drill the wells as quick as you could. A few years after Robert Galbraith discovered the Glen Pool, so many wells had been drilled that the derricks covered more than 12 square miles. The land was producing more crude than any place in the world. And it would keep coming, you know, you'd just keep pumping it out. And, uh, you know, and if you could find a buyer, if you could get it to the markets, if you could get it to the refineries, it just would keep coming. The production at Glenpool was so much greater than any that had been seen in Oklahoma that for a time there was a tremendous problem. They couldn't build storage tanks fast enough. They couldn't ship it out by rail fast enough. So they had to dam up ravines and make lakes. And you literally had massive lakes of crude oil. Oil had been discovered before that in Texas. But Texas oil was lousy. It was very thick, it had a high sulfur content. It was very, very hard to refine. Glenpool oil was premium oil. It was very light, it was low in sulfur, very rich in both kerosene and gasoline, and very easy to refine. Just as the Glenpool was developing into the world's greatest oil field, the nation's thirst for oil was growing. The motor carriage was rapidly replacing the horse and buggy as a reliable form of transportation. With more autos hitting the road, oil was needed more than ever for lubrication and gasoline. With the internal combustion engine and the automobile and the airplane and whatever else, there was a tremendous demand for petroleum as a fuel. And as the automobile increased and every family had to have one, demand for cheap gas and oil uh, was there oil became almost the lifeblood of the nation. Because America needed oil and the Glenpool had a good supply, two big oil companies, Texaco and Gulf, began building pipelines so the Glenpool crude could flow from Oklahoma. These pipelines went from the Glenpool south across Texas to refineries on the Gulf Coast. These were the longest pipelines in America of that time, spanning over 450 miles, making it possible for Oklahoma crude to reach consumers nationwide. It cost a dollar a barrel to ship oil by rail, which is the only method we had before this. It cost 10 cents a barrel to ship it by pipeline. 
At 10 cents a barrel shipping crude, you make a lot more money. When the pipelines came, big money came. Well, there was big money now in the Glen Pool, and this was serious, now a serious, serious venture. With pipelines in place, the Glen Pool was putting out more than 100,000 barrels of crude daily to refineries in Texas. By 1907, no oil field was bigger or more important than the Glen Pool, America's largest single source of petroleum. In 1907, the state of Oklahoma produced more oil than any other state in the United States and any other country in the world, including the Middle East. Oklahoma had become the oil capital of the world, and Glen Pool started the whole thing. There were millions and millions of barrels being produced by the Glen Pool. On its peak day, it produced 117,500 barrels of oil. It was a, a mighty field. And it certainly was the first giant oil field in Oklahoma. And as such, it focused the attention of oil men nationally on this region. Charlie Shobe, a poor farmer from Ohio, boarded a train and headed west for the Glen Pool. Every day, hundreds of people like Charlie Shobe were moving to Oklahoma to find jobs in petroleum. There was good pay for the men who built derricks and for the roughnecks who worked on the rigs and the roustabouts who labored in the oil fields. The Glen Pool created good jobs. People with only a dime in their pocket could walk in and find a job out on the oil fields. They may be digging trenches or laying some pipe. But there's also a need for a trained labor force too. The Glen Pool and that oil industry would require a lot of people with know-how to come in and work those fields. The size, type, and kind of Glen Pool attracted the manufacturers also. For instance, if you uh, produced oil faster than you could sell it, you had to build tanks. Tank building became a very big business here. Or you would pipeline it someplace else, and pipelining became big business. And that brings a lot of welders, it brings a lot of, of manufacturers of valves and pumps and that sort of thing. Four trains would arrive every day from Kansas City. Three trains daily from St. Louis. The railroad cars were packed with people bound for the Glen Pool. And they all came here, wildcatters and risk takers. Everybody who had a dream, they came to these oil lands to strike it rich, to get a piece of that action. Year after year, the trains continued bringing to Oklahoma thousands of oil men bankers, equipment suppliers, laborers. Many of them ended up settling their families and their businesses in Tulsa, 14 miles from the Glen Pool. Tulsa was an appealing place to locate because it was close to the oil patch, but far enough away to stay clean. The city had the finest hotels in the area and good railroad service with frequent trains running to the big cities back east and to the Glen Pool. Hundreds of oil companies put down roots in Tulsa. The financial corporate organizations were here in Tulsa, but they were going out to the boondocks, effectively, to drill the wells. Tulsa became the headquarters. Tulsa became the center of, of many of these people controlling the oil fields. So if you wanted money to drill a well or to develop the field, you would come to Tulsa. By 1910, no place in America had more oil men or petroleum resources than the Glen Pool and Tulsa. The area had become an oil empire. Then, wildcatters, men who searched for petroleum in remote places, began scouring other parts of Oklahoma. One wildcatter, Tom Slick, came from Pennsylvania and in 1912 hit a gusher 45 miles southwest of Tulsa. This opened the Cushing oil field. Slick became a millionaire and Oklahoma had its second big oil field. And the timing was perfect because America and her allies were heading into World War I. 
suddenly you have to have gasoline for those tanks or diesel for the trucks. There's demand for fuel in the factories making the bombs and the uniforms and the, the vehicles. And so just as this demand hits, Cushing is there, which is a deep field, and it is flowing. Production doubles and then triples and quadruples in a matter of months. And this oil is flowing out. During the teens, Cushing was the largest and richest oil field in the country, producing one-fifth of the crude consumed in the United States. But there was always a need for more. Wildcatters continued pushing across Oklahoma, drilling wells in remote places. Sometimes they were lucky, sometimes they were not. Where a gambler might risk everything on the turn of a card, these guys would risk everything they had on where they, they tried an oil well. They were enormous gamblers, but if they hadn't been, they wouldn't have been successful. They would, uh, I mean, just bet the ranch on drilling one well, and it was dry hole, and they were just out of money, up to debt, family was mad at them, that sort of thing, and they just sort of said, well, you know, that's just the way it goes, that's part of the business, and then they'd go off, and a couple years later, they'd show up again with some new investors, a new idea, and drill a well, and then, boom, they'd hit. Boy, were they happy. <laughs> In the early part of the 1900s, the search for black gold uncovered many big oil fields across Oklahoma. Hilton, Burbank, Stroud, Seminole, and Oklahoma City were among the giant petroleum fields to hit after Glenpool and Cushing. By the late 1920s, Oklahoma was producing one-third of the nation's crude. More money came out of the Oklahoma oil boom between 1900 and 1930 than the gold rush to California and the silver rush to Colorado combined. More money came out. Each new oil discovery brought more people to Oklahoma. On the fringes of the oil fields rose boom towns like Kiefer, Oilton, and Cromwell. These were rowdy places, overrun with people who had come for the excitement and for the work. Most of the people who came to the boom towns were, as far as workers, were single men. Or if they were married, they left their families behind because they didn't want to drag them around and expose them to the environment of these towns. If they couldn't get directly involved in the oil business and taking, extracting that oil from the ground, they got involved in a sidebar business, you know, whether they're peddling flesh or whiskey or hot meals or a place to stay or real estate, whatever. Roughnecks who worked on the rigs and roustabouts who labored in the oil fields made decent money. But the work was dirty and hard. Living conditions were unpleasant. There was almost no place to sleep. People slept in chicken coops and corn cribs and under and on pool tables and in theater seats. Food was hard to get and generally wasn't very well cooked. Uh, groceries were very difficult to get. People ate standing up. In some of the restaurants, they actually nailed the plates down to the tables for people to eat out of. You'd come in, you would eat, some guy would walk around, swab out your plate, put another a deal of stew in it, another guy would sit down. Fires in those towns were terrible. They would often take much of a town out with a single fire. Things were calmer in Tulsa. Drilling rigs were not permitted in city limits. This was the business and financial center of the oil world. As more crude flowed from Oklahoma oil fields, more money passed through Tulsa banks and businesses. By the 1920s, Tulsa was one of the most prosperous cities in America and growing fast. There was so much construction going on, financed by this oil money, so many riveters, they actually had to dismiss classes. It was too noisy. These were good problems. They could have built anything, but no, they wanted the best, the brightest, and the most modern for Tulsa, too. It was known as the oil capital of the world, and they wanted to live in a place that lived up to that name. Tulsa also benefited from the giants of petroleum who settled in the city. Thomas Gilcrease, Waite Phillips, Bill Skelly, Robert McFarlane, and James Chapman. 
each made a fortune in the Glen Pool and subsequent oil fields, then put much of their wealth back into the community to support museums and the arts, schools and education, and hospitals. To make sure that the community thrived and that the schools were good and that the air was clean and that the water was pure and that there was a good place to raise your children, even if your money came from an oil field that was 15 miles away or 40 miles away. Visitors coming in from the East Coast were amazed by what they found in Tulsa. Here on the edge of the oil patch was a city with eye-popping architecture, with stores selling expensive clothing and jewelry. Millionaires were everywhere. Tulsa was the New York City of the Prairie. It was a town with plenty of money and a desire to be the best. If I build a grand mansion, it's more home than I need, but it's an expression of this hope that we are going to be the Riviera of America, that we are the, the Malibu. This is the place to be. This is where we'll have the grandest homes in the greatest country club and the fanciest Art Deco buildings. These people saw that in their minds. By the 1950s, more than 700 petroleum firms were headquartered in the city. Oil money built everything from office towers to Art Deco churches. And Tulsa was permanent host of the International Petroleum Exposition. Held every few years, it was the World's Fair of the Oil Business, featuring a dazzling display of derricks and equipment. It was equivalent to Mardi Gras. They had huge parades, they had King and Queen Petroleum. It brought people in from all around the world to Tulsa. Tulsa was also the center of innovation. You had the University of Tulsa, the Petroleum Geology. You had many innovations develop out of the Tulsa area. Oil money was absolutely the foundation of Tulsa. No other industry came to Tulsa and developed it in the, in the same way that oil money did. By discovering the Glen Pool, Robert Galbraith became a millionaire. However, he was not a good businessman, lost much of his fortune, and lived out his last years modestly in Tulsa. The Glen Pool, once the world's greatest oil field, faded with time. Pastures and houses dot the landscape today. Some wells still operate. The oil field is mighty no more but it leaves a lasting legacy. It wasn't the biggest strike in Oklahoma by a long shot, but it may, in many ways it may have been the most important because it got everything up and rolling. It brought in people with money, brought in people with guts, people willing to take chances. I look on the Glen Pool as that the oil itself wasn't a legacy. I think the people who came were the legacy. Some of them had no skills, absolutely no skills. Uh, when they came to the Glen Pool, but they left with those skills, and those skills migrated to the other fields. So in that sense, uh, the Glen Pool was this great training ground. The legacy of Glen Pool is that Tulsa was the oil capital of the world for almost 50 years. Without Glen Pool, probably doesn't happen. We wouldn't have the spirit that is so unique to Oklahoma and to Tulsa without oil. The Glen Pool may be a memory, but oil and gas remains Oklahoma's biggest industry. Vast amounts of crude continue flowing from the ground. But now there is more emphasis on producing natural gas, a clean fuel that's plentiful in Oklahoma. Oklahoma is now a natural gas and oil producer. Probably three times as much wealth, gross product sales from natural gas in Oklahoma than crude oil. The market for natural gas has grown and has, has kept the drilling boom going in Oklahoma uh, as we shift gradually from oil to uh, natural gas. Natural gas is definitely the new energy frontier for Oklahoma. We are the second largest natural gas producer in America. The large petroleum pipelines which started coming into Oklahoma during the Glen Pool era have expanded around the state. Thousands of miles of crude and natural gas pipelines are the veins of the energy business, moving petroleum to consumers in Oklahoma and the entire country. 
about 70% of all the natural gas that we produce, we ship out of the state. So you could say Oklahoma is helping fuel America. The oil and gas business pumps millions of dollars into Oklahoma's economy each year, paying for roads, schools, and museums. More than 50,000 Oklahomans work in energy, and not just on the rigs. Many jobs are high-tech. Computers can now pinpoint reserves beneath the earth and show where to drill. As the oil and gas business keeps advancing, new jobs are created. The industry has a bright future. In the old days, one man and a couple of his buddies could get together and go drill a well. Today, the kinds of projects that we're undertaking are like $50 million wells in 7,000 feet of water. The technology that that's required far exceed anything that anyone dreamed of uh, just a few decades ago. To be able to drill four or five miles deep and bring that production to the surface and then ultimately know that that goes into our homes and our workplaces, it, it's a very exciting high-tech industry. Robert Galbraith had no idea when he discovered the Glen Pool how important oil and gas would become. That one oil field attracted many people to Oklahoma, provided a good living, helped build cities, and gave Oklahoma a rich legacy that lives today. We've got to remember that history, that legacy that oil created. As a couple of the old timers would have said if they were here today, don't forget who brung you to the dance. And it was oil. And that's who brung Oklahoma to the dance. And it was a mighty sweet waltz. This program is made possible by Explorer Pipeline, by the OERB, representing Oklahoma's producers and royalty owners, and by ConocoPhillips.